Welcome to Electron Line. In this video, we're going to show you how to find which members are under tension and which members are under compression. Now, of course, we can do this mathematically at each joint by summing up all the forces in the x and the y directions. We can also do it by finding the moments about different points, but there's other ways in which you can quickly determine whether or not members are under tension or compression. This is kind of a strange contraption. Notice that if we put a a point of rotation right here and there's a solid structure basically because all the members are holding this thing together you can see that this would simply tip this thing over that means we're going to need a force holding this down to this structure right here so there's going to be a force let's say this is point A this is point B then we are definitely going to need a force acting downward at A this is point B and that would then be the pivot point about which this whole structure would balance Nevertheless, we're still trying to find which members are under tension and which members are under compression. One way to look at that is to say, in this particular case, let's say this member wasn't here and this member was free to rotate. If this member was free to rotate, the radius arm of this member would so look something like this. And would we'll rotate in this direction. Since this force is acting in this direction, if you now take a point on the force, on the line of action of the force down here, and think about the distance from there to there would be greater than the length of this particular member. In other words, if this member was attached here and you try to rotate it in this direction, it wouldn't be able to reach to the line of action of the force down below it, which means you would have to stretch this member out, which means this member is under tension. If you use the same logic for this member right here, let's say that this member was not here, you're trying to rotate this member straight down this way, you can see that based upon its orientation, the radius arm of that member would look something like this. The distance from there to there is less than the distance of the length of the member. You couldn't force the beam to follow, the edge of the beam to follow this line here, this line of action of the force, you would therefore have to compress it or shrink the size of the beam, which means that this force causes this beam to be under compression. Now beams that are under tension, they pull on each side of the joint, which means there's a force in this direction and there's a force in this direction based upon this beam being under tension. If a beam is under compression, the force will act against the joint in that direction and against the joint in this direction. Now if we take a look at this joint right here, and we subdivide the force, the tension force on this member right here in the x and y direction. That means we would have an x component in this direction and a y component in this direction, which means that at this joint, this member right here must contract this component of the tension forces of this member, which means this beam is being compressed. Therefore, that beam is under compression. But notice, relative to this beam right here, this force, this component of the tension force of this member causes this member to be pulled in this direction. This member will pull back, therefore this member will be under tension. The only way that this can counteract that force would be that if the force on this beam acts in this direction, and the force on this beam must be acting in this direction. Now when we take a look at this joint right here, Notice if this beam is under tension pulling in this direction, this vertical beam here cannot compensate for that in any way. In other words, this beam must take over the compensation action or reaction force to this tension right here. If this beam is being pulled in this direction, then this beam needs to keep that in place. Therefore, this beam pushes back. This beam must therefore be under compression, which means that the horizontal component of this compression force on this beam, on this member, must act in this direction, compensating for this force right here, and then you have this component right there. Now, if this beam is under compression, pushing upward in that direction, then this beam must be under tension because it must keep this beam from being pushed up in that direction, and that means that this beam here must be under tension. And finally, one more joint to deal with, if we now look at this joint right here, notice we have basically three members. We have 
one beam right here, one member, a second member, and then we have a force acting on it, but this force is collinear with this member and perpendicular to this member, which means this member cannot have any force acting on it. This must be a zero force member, and we'll just go ahead and put a zero on top of that. And that's how we determine which beams or which members are under compression, which members are under tension, and in this case also we found one more uh, member that had a zero force on it, so we call that a zero force member. But again, remember that if you think about the way in which beams could swing, if there was no secondary beam attached to it, and there was a way in which you can let the beam swivel back and forth, that kind of determines in that way which of these two beams must be under tension and which of those beams must be under compression. It's kind of a handy way to look at it, and then you just kind of work your way through the structure to determine the compression and tension on the other beams. And that's one way in which you can determine the tension and compression on the various members of a structure. And that's how it's done.